<laughs> okay, there we go. Uh, so, as I said, I am Steve Rader. I'm here from NASA, uh, from Houston Johnson Space Center, uh, and I'm really excited to be here at StartCon. Um, this is an exciting year for us. We uh, turned 60 this year at NASA, and we're celebrating 60 years of NASA. Um, and I was reflecting on that as we were getting started, uh, and I was putting this together, and I thought, you know, <laughs> they said I was at NASA for 20 years, but um, actually next year's 30 years uh, at NASA, and I, I shouldn't admit that, but um, I was thinking about that, and I was like, wow, before I got to NASA, we put some of the first people into space, we landed on the moon, we did some incredible things, we created, uh, developed a shuttle, we uh, actually got flying a, a bunch of Earth satellites, uh, we, we sent stuff to Mars, uh, some of the early probes out to the, to the planets, and now that I've been working there in this past 30 years, we've developed the International Space Station and have actually been on the ISS now for, for almost 18 years, fully manned the entire time, six astronauts con continuously in space. Um, and we've put four different rovers, several landers on Mars, and as of three days ago, the Mars InSight lander. Anybody get up early and watch that? It's, it's exciting stuff, right? Um, and we're moving into an even more exciting time in space. We've built an incredible uh, commercial space uh, industry. It's, it's billions of dollars a year. Uh, there are launches literally uh, multiple times a week that you never hear about because it's such a regular access to space. Uh, not too long ago, about a year or so ago, there was a day where we had six astronauts on space station, the three of them got into a Soyuz and started coming back. At the same time, the Chinese launched two folks up to one of their space stations. We had a commercial uh, logistics module that was launched that day and headed to space station, and we launched a Mars probe. So think about that for a second. In a single day, there were six different astronauts on three spacecraft all up in low Earth orbit while two other unmanned spacecraft were being launched. You almost needed like air traffic control for space, right? Um, and when you look ahead to what, what's coming, we are actually actively working in the next couple of years to have the first crew members that go up on uh, SpaceX and Boeing, our first commercial crews, which then start to open up space access for everyone. Um, we'll actually start working on Orion, and I'll talk a little bit more about that, which is, will enable us to do deep space exploration. We're working on supersonic jets uh, and, and actually making that something that can, can be uh, commercial. And we're doing that with these new kind of concepts of fiscal realism. When we went to the moon, we had 5% of the U.S. federal budget. Now, for the last 20 years, we've had 0.5% of the federal budget. Still a lot of money, but not the kind of money that they had when they were trying to get us to the moon. Um, we have a lot of commercial and international partnerships. We're, we're doing technology push and pull. We're building up an open, uh, an open architecture that the entire world can collaborate on and, and partner with us. So it's an exciting time. We are building one of the largest rockets, the Space Launch System, which will actually be one of the largest rockets ever built, along with the Orion system. And this gives us a collection of launch capability that will allow us to start moving beyond low Earth orbit and into uh, the, the deep, what we call deep space. And that actually causes us some significant uh, uh, challenges that are actually going to start, start uh, being there as we progress. You can see we're moving out of space station in low Earth orbit. We're starting to get the Orion space. We'll have uh, the Exploration Mission 1, which is an unmanned uh, demonstration mission uh, mid-2020, and by 2023, we'll actually have our first crewed uh, uh, human version going on EM2, and we'll start to actually build up this gateway. The, the new administration has actually put an emphasis on visiting the moon and actually starting to develop a capability there, not just for the moon, but actually a, a launch out uh, from, from there that we can go to Mars or other places. And in fact, we're building this new gateway, which is going to be a kind of replacement for space station, but starting to help us prove out what it takes to live in deep space. And there are significant challenges with this. If you look and compare to where we've been, we've been in low Earth orbit where it takes about three hours to get back home. It doesn't, we're only going about 28,000 kilometers an hour, and so when, when the, the heat's not too bad coming back, but when you start going to the moon or to Mars, that actually 
goes up quite a bit more. And in fact, if you are familiar with the rocket equation, you know that once you actually try to get things back from one of these bodies, that getting into the gravity well and coming back, you have to start multiplying out, not by two, but by 10 and, and more in a geometric relationship to actually get the mass there that will get you back. So all of this conspires to, that we have significantly big challenges that require giant leaps if we really want to get beyond low Earth orbit and start exploring. Which leads us to what I actually work on. I work in a small office called the Center of Excellence for Collaborative Innovation. Like you said, the longest title. It's horrible to try to tell people. Um, but what we do is we actually host the NASA Tournament Lab. And that is an organization that works across NASA as well as across the entire US federal government to actually help people learn about and use crowdsourcing and open innovation. Open innovation is that, that innovation that, that you reach outside of your organization to find because you actually can't access it within your own organization. And so we're learning how to use these tools and we're enabling it for uh, the rest of the government. So this NASA tournament lab, we actually meet with, it's gonna come here in a second, we meet with different uh, agencies, we meet with different projects, and we help them to understand how to take the really hard challenges that they are facing and turn those into crowdsourced challenges that we can either put to our internal crowd, so we have a crowd of about 20,000 uh, NASA employees because we employ some of the smartest folks in the world, that is our first stop. We ask them, how can we solve this problem? How can we do it together and, and do that as a community? But then we also have contracts with what we call curated crowds. These are communities all around the world, hundreds of thousands, sometimes millions of people that actually work uh, to engage the public to do different kinds of innovation work. And in fact, what's great about this is as NASA, we, we feel a responsibility to engage the public. And for years, the way we've done that is to say, look at this really cool stuff we're doing in space. Don't you wish you were us? Right? But what we're doing now is we're actually posting problems and challenges and things that we are trying to work on and asking the public through these platforms to participate with us in actually building the solutions. And so you can see we work across all of these kinds of organizations and they're amazing, right? Let me just hit on a few. GrabCAD, five million mechanical engineers and designers that all come together around that kind of nerdiness that is mechanical design and we can run a challenge on there and get amazing results. And, and we get all of these folks that are really smart, uh, really good at that, uh, to give us new ideas. Uh, freelancer, 31 million people around the world that we can post challenges to, and they all come together to try to actually come up with, with uh, new work that we uh, have posted. Uh, in a sense of 400,000 problem solvers. These are people that are passionate about problem solving, but it's a very diverse, a set of people, and so if, you're, if you understand where innovation comes from and are watching some of the literature on that, what you realize is that innovation comes from diversity. That, that if you could solve that within your own domain, you would have solved it already. And it's actually getting outside of that domain and finding people that actually have access to other technologies or other knowledge is what brings in uh, really innovative stuff. Uh, top coder, 1.4 million software developers and data scientists, along with Kaggle at 1.6 million. There is work going on in the data science and algorithm world with contests that is unsurpassed. We have seen multiple times where we go to, to, to develop a new algorithm and uh, we'll get a, like a 20x to a 40x improvement on that algorithm through a challenge. We just went, did one for Homeland Security to kind of help with that, that scanner you go through at the airport because it has a really, I don't know if you've noticed, but every fifth person gets a positive and they have to be patted down. We've increased that through a crowdsource challenge on Kaggle to something like 98% accuracy. Just some amazing work going on there. Um, and so what we do is we work with, with different projects to expose them and say, hey, there's some new tools out there. And we can post these as challenges, we can post these as tasks out in the freelance world and get some amazing results. So I'm just gonna walk through a couple of those results. There we go. We've uh, done about 300 challenges. That's results in about uh, 1,000 to 1,500 contests. 90% uh, of those are successful. 
In fact, I think our, our failure rate is around 6% where we don't get anything of use. Um, it's really amazing results because when we look at the cost savings we're getting through these, that, that, that compared to traditional means, we're getting cost results that are 80% uh, of the time at cost savings. Those cost savings average 40%. If you look at some of the examples, this is a great one, because it really kind of shows you why this innovation piece is so important. We posted a challenge uh, to try to predict solar flares, right? So we have space station astronauts, they go out on EVA, suddenly we get an alert that there's going to be a solar flare. They have to get in. The current capability was about two hour predictions. So they would have two hours to try to make their way all the way in, get out of their suits, and get into a safe spot in the space station in order to, to, to keep from, from getting uh, bad health effects. We put that out to the crowd and said, look, how can we improve this algorithm? And the winner actually came up with a 4x improvement, an eight-hour prediction capability. But that person wasn't a heliophysicist. They were actually a radio frequency engineer that was semi-retired, that come off of a cell phone company, and understood that math required to get a signal out of noise, if you know what I'm talking about. And it just so happens he had an undergraduate degree that he had never used in his work life in heliophysics. But the answer to get this from two hours to eight hours was to apply that math to this problem. So when I talk about you have to get out you have to use the open, you have to get out of your own domain. It's this kind of cross-pollination that's required to get the new innovations. Um, we actually posted one on asteroid data hunters. As you would hope, we at NASA are constantly seeking asteroids because they're really hard to see and they might pose some danger to us on Earth. We don't know that for sure on any right now, but, but we know that it's really hard to detect them, right? And so we want to get better at that. So we did a top coder challenge and actually got uh, an algorithm that was 15% better at finding asteroids than our baseline. But not only that, for this about 200K, we also got an, a downloadable multi-platform uh, app that could be downloaded for amateur astronomers to look, because part of the problem is how, how the, the night sky is really huge, and how do you cover that to actually get all the asteroids uh, detected out of the sky? So improve that capability significantly. Um, some other examples, robonaut vision algorithms, uh, constantly working on robotic vision so that we can actually use these in autonomous ways, which as we get farther and farther from Earth, we're going to have to have more automated ways to, to do business. Uh, the ISS Food Intake Tracker, an application developed at, uh, through, through uh, Top Coder that gave us a really amazing app for very little money, very quickly, and <laughs> the astronauts, the first thing they said was, oh, this, we didn't develop this at NASA, did we? <laughs> right? It had that commercial feel to it. And that has actually been flying on Space Station now for about three years. It was shown at the Apple Developer Conference. Really an amazing app. Um, Freelancer. We actually went to Freelancer about three years ago and started running a pilot to see, wait, we can actually do really low-cost challenges uh, on Freelancer. And we're still not sure exactly what the limits to that are. We actually posted a challenge here to come up with a, a, an inner user interface for a, a, a smartwatch app that the crew could use while they were on space station. Give them their timeline, their caution and warning messages, their comm status. Um, put it out there for a $1,500 prize, got 245 submissions, amazing stuff. The winners of that were professional UI experts that, that gave us this beautiful interface. And then at the end of that, a uh, freelancer came back and said, well, you know, we can, we can implement that for you. And it just so happened that I was limited to $3,000. That's all I could spend with them because of a, a law. <laughs> we had lots of those. Um, and sure enough, they said, no, we can do that. And they got a, a freelancer to implement the prototype code for $3,000. And so $4,500 later, I go from having a concept of something that might be a useful tool to a demonstrable working smartwatch app, just like that. We've, d we've gone on to do things like uh, do a video for one of the, the projects that was having a hard time communicating, and they actually, we, we did a storyboard challenge, I think actually later today, the, the person that won this is gonna be here, Lauren Fell, and, and gave us this really great storyboard that then we turned into a full CGI three minute video. Total cost to us was about $4,500. Amazing stuff. And these are areas we wouldn't normally do, do this kind of work. Our origami radiation shielding challenge, as we get outside of low Earth 
uh, radiation is a significant risk to us. Uh, the Van Allen belts protect you from that when you're in low Earth orbit. And so we've started early work, and one of those was, are there origami-shaped concepts that we could use to actually get radiation shielding? And came up with some really amazing stuff uh, out of a freelancer challenge. Uh, we're currently running a series of robotic arm challenges. We have this free-floating uh, thing called the Astro B that's going to float around the space station. It's going to find things, but it has this tiny little robot arm. And we actually have the active contests right now going on to design these. And what's really crazy is we've got like 200 different freelancers that are submitting different designs and giving us really amazing work. Uh, and if you look at their resumes, they are roboticists. They are PhD material scientists. There are some amazing talent out there that we are accessing through these mechanisms. Okay. This is just our portfolio to, to tell you a little bit of, of the kinds of things we've done and what we've done. You can see we use lots of different crowds. And these crowds represent literally tens of millions of people. And we're doing things like algorithms and software and apps and the things I've shown you. Uh, and Honestly, we're still experimenting with this. We don't know what the limits of this are, but what we do know is almost every time we use them, we're getting amazing results. And so this is leading us kind of down a road, right, that says, and, and as we take a step back, we're seeing that this is more than just contests. It's more than just these curated communities. We're seeing a new move to what they're calling the human cloud framework. And in fact, there's lots of studies coming up about this. There's lots of talk about the future of work. But it is this idea that there's, there's these, these crowdsourcing platforms, there's these gig workers, there's these staffing platforms. And there were, um, um, some of the data that's coming out is showing that the increase in people that are freelancing, coming out and doing full-time freelance work, is increasing about three times the rate of normal employment. And if that continues, one study shows that by 2027, there will be more freelance employees than there are people working for companies and organizations. And that's a, that's a big deal, right? Because that's a very significant shift from where we are today, where organizations are king. People often forget that organizations, the way we have them defined today, are only about 100, 150 years old. It's not necessarily the way to do things. And if you look at how organizations uh, work, you quickly find there's loads of overhead involved in that structure. And there's some efficiencies to be had here that could actually be the kind of thing that we need for the workforce of the future because they can actually adapt quickly to the changing technologies. Right? One of the problems in the technology world today is that things are changing so fast. Right? So for instance, automation's been taking jobs for years. The only thing is, it's been taking them slowly. And people have had time to adapt. They've been time to retrain, literally 10, 15 years, go back to university, get more jobs. What we're seeing now is technology is changing so fast that the rate of change is the problem. Automation's been there for the whole, whole time. It's the rate that things are automating. It's the rate of change. And in this new workforce, People can pivot almost instantly, can take new training, can actually adapt to this much, much quicker. So for us, it's kind of like what Wayne Gretzky says, right? If you want to be a really good hockey player, you don't skate to where the, 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 the puck is. You, you skate to where it's going to be. And so we're looking at these trends and thinking, wait a second, if this is happening, there are significant things about the way we work that we actually need to, to be looking at. The beauty of this, this new kind of construct is that these communities are actually forming communities of practice. They're actually starting to get critical mass of skills together. So that's why Kaggle, for instance, 1.6 million data scientists are doing amazing things that have never been done through contests and through collaborations and through teaming. And if you look at what Top Coder's doing, they're doing things in software that have never been done. And it's because these people are learning from each other. There's literally millions of people getting together around a given topic. If you go to Tongle, 100,000 filmmakers that are passionate about filmmaking. And they're finding new ways to do that as a community. Um, some of these 
communities like Incentive and Nine Sigma are actually capitalizing on the diversity factor, people that are from very different backgrounds for problem solving, because that's actually what's the currency of problem solving and finding innovations is diversity. And so they're actually uh, uh, finding ways to actually structure the way they decompose problems, the way they attack them, and to bring in new people to find that. Um, if you think about where this could go, this new work versus on-demand, it's persistent. It's both global, global and hyper-local, right? Think about the Uber driver that brought you here. He's part of a member of a global crowd, but actually showed up at your doorstep. If you look at the, uh, the, the amount of work and the type of work, it can go, be from anywhere from classifying images, kind of grunt work, all the way up to, I don't know, we ran a challenge for Galactic Cosmic Ray, and the top seven finalists were all nuclear physicists from around the world. And they had each put in a significant amount of work to try to actually win the prize. And I don't know how you go and hire a bunch of nuclear physicists, but I thought that was a really effective, cost-effective way to do that, right? Lifelong learners, they actually can keep up with the speed of the latest tech. What's one of the biggest problems that companies are having right now? Finding the talent, right? This is a matching algorithm. That's what's happening here. These platforms are providing the way to take a need and match it to who can do that. Challenges happen to be a good way to do that when you don't know what you need, because you can put out a problem, and then the person that can solve that will find you. But for a lot of things, I just need somebody who's a data scientist that can handle this job. I can match directly to that through a freelance site, right? Through a staffing site. Um, it's this low friction access that's actually getting better and better. There are already crowds that are using machine learning to match people to tasks. There are ways that in the future that they're going to actually start being able to as uh, assemble high-performing teams. And if you've ever worked with high-performing teams, you know that they operate at significantly higher output. Uh, and then there's a bunch of specialty tools coming along. Think about um, in the manufacturing world, uh, metal 3D printers, uh, some of the different uh, laser cutting tools. These are going to be able to be orchestrated together as a real capability and not just hobbyist. Um, there's still work to go here, but again, if you're aiming to where the puck is going, <laughs> then you start looking at this stuff and start seeing how you can use it. This is my get off the stage chart. Um, open is the future. If you are narrow in your own discipline, you are missing out on where innovation comes from. Um, it is the future. And reaching either if that's inside your own company and opening your own company to where it's actually uh, a large enough organization that you're getting the best ideas from across the organization, or reaching out into other domains, open is extremely important. And innovation is no longer optional. As soon as the speed of change gets faster than the speed that your company or organization is able to change, there's an expiration date on your company, right? Because you're not keeping up. And we know that that rate of change is getting faster and faster and faster. And so we're seeing this as a possible resource to actually uh, get this, this capability. We're seeing this as a way to attract passion. If you look at these communities, they are people with a passion. They actually were so interested in this that they went and they signed up on a website and they started interacting with it. Casual people don't do that. People with passion do that. And if you look at what people do in their job, it's not about the paycheck. It's about mattering. It's about doing something they care about. And you know what? In the, in the new workforce that's coming, the reason they're going to stay there is because they can do their passion. And everyone wants to do their passion. Um, there was a, as part of one of these reports, they did a, a, a survey of full-time freelancers. And they said, hey, um, how much would it take for a company to offer you to actually go back to work for, for some organization? Over half said, there is no amount of money you could pay me to go back. <laughs> That's a stunning message. Um, these open methods are extremely effective for accessing these valuable innovations and ac accessing expertise. And what we're really seeing already is those that fail to innovate will no longer be here. I don't know if you've heard this stat before, but over the last 15 years, if you looked at the Fortune 500 list, half of those companies no longer exist. In 1958, the average lifespan of a company was 61 years. 
In 2017, it was 18. Things are changing, and we have to figure out how to get to that, that point. That is it for me. Thank you.